Now this A-level anthology Buddhism video, this is section 13 of A.L. Basham's uh, The Bodhisattva. Uh, let's read it and we'll analyze it. So, here we go. One of the reasons for including this passage is its remarkable resemblance to the famous parable of St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. As the lotus of good law, from which the Buddhist story is taken, was probably in existence well before Christian ideas could have found their way in India via Persia. It's unlikely that this parable owes anything to the Christian one. Similarly, it's unlikely that the Christian parable is in debt to the Buddhist. Probably we have here a case of religious minds of two widely separated cultures thinking along similar lines as a result of a similar, but not identical, religious experience. For this reason, resemblances and differences of the two stories are the most, are the most instructive. Okay, let's think about this. First of all, why is, is Basham making links with the Bible here? One of the reasons for the concluding this passage is its remarkable resemblance to the famous parable in St. Luke's Gospel. Well, it's because, as Shanti Deva quotes in his Compendium of Doctrine, uh, the Lotus Sutra uh, which is for Mahayana but is considered the word of the Buddha, although it wouldn't be considered uh, to have arrived in the similar sort of way, it's delivered supernaturally, um, has this very similar story. Uh, Shanti Deva was this 8th century Indian monk, scholar Nalanda, he was an adherent of Madhyamaka philosophy, of Nargajuna. Uh, the significance of this Tibetan text is its late dating, which allows or the influence of Nestorian Christianity on Buddhism. So while the Lotus Sutra may not have been influenced, it's very possible that Shanti Deva was influenced. And when he quotes this, he might well have read Luke's Gospel. And I wonder what that might have inspired in his thinking. And, and I suspect Basher was having the same thoughts. T enough time had elapsed for the for Christianity uh, to have found its way to India via Persia, via the Nestorian Christian route. So it's unlikely the original Lotus Sutra does, but is this uh, quotation an exact quotation, or has it been, or is it being used because of, uh, you know, the, the encroaching influence of Nestorian Christianity? Well, let's go on. Um, is it really remarkable? It's remarkable resemblance. Is it really that remarkable that there are two stories of fathers and wayward sons? Well, clearly Basham isn't that persuaded himself, at least about the original story. He says this parable owes anything to the Christian one is unlikely. It's unlikely. And the, the reverse is true, that the Christian, even less likely perhaps, the Christian parable is indebted to the Buddhist one. So what's the answer? Well, it's just very similar features of ordinary life or what people make stories about. So while there are surface level similarities, uh, the consensus is given that probably the dating, the early dating of the earliest strat of the Lotus Sutra, uh, the parable comes from is from chapter four is is first century before the you know in in the middle of the first century there's just no way one could have influenced the other so it's unlikely that mythology affecting mythology and now Basham is admitting that that it's just not possible and that there are significant differences which reflect divergent doctrines there is evidence of this is evidence of this um, now Basham refers to the Lotus Sutra as the 
as the lotus of good law. Now, I wonder why he's referring to it as good law. Well, I guess uh, it's not so much Basham, but this is, um, well, it's one of the names of the Lotus Sutra. It's a more polemical name. And, and Basham, I suppose, wants to draw our attention to the effect of polemics on the emergence and evolution of religious ideas, suggesting that if there's good law, there's bad law. What's the bad law? Well, it's the teaching of Theravada. And, it, and this name for this early Mahayana text is that is venerated as the quintessential truth today by a great many Buddhists, the Japanese Buddhists of the Tendai tradition, Nitrian sects. Uh, the Lotus Sutra has this high Buddhology, this exalted idea of the Bodhisattva. And it, it again and again repudiates the Theravada, which it calls the Hinayana, the the lesser way goals of, uh, you know, emancipation, liberation, Nibbana is inferior. And the Mahayana goals of becoming a Buddha to be much, much better. So if this Basham thinks it's not a parallelism, what is it? Well, Basham explains himself, and he's perhaps ahead of his time. He says, Probably we have here the case of religious minds thinking along similar lines. Now, this wouldn't have been fashionable for him to say in, in what, the late 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, it was still the heyday of parallelism, still very much there in the Internet. Oh, the myth of Jesus is a product of, um, you know, the mythology in Egypt. And if you look on the Internet, and there's a lot of people saying that no reputable scholar is. And Basham, if nothing else, is a reputable scholar. He doesn't mind saying things at times that are unfashionable. Um, he won't cross the line of saying things that are not, well, supernatural, that are, or, or sorry, are not natural. We'll see. We'll see about that in a second. His evolutionary approach to the history of religion, the, or the, history, the ideas of religion, is to a view of the Bodhisattva as a purely natural process. but And that's problematic. It, that has its own bias that may do things to the text. Um, is Basham open to the supernatural or is he just being agnostic? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, look at this last section here. Uh, we'll go for red. As a result of similar though not identical, religious experience. Wow, that's a very interesting line to put in. I wonder, is Basham someone like William James? Is he a pragmatist? Is he open to religious experience? Not even an agnostic like Donovan. Um, he doesn't even use the words, it doesn't seem, he's not using the word seems as, Don, as the agnostic Donovan uh, result. Of it. it seems like he's more like William Jamesian, acknowledging some kind of God exists, but a very vague idea of God or the divine. As he does say, the two stories are most instructive while he returns to his nice academic way of thinking. But most instructive, most interesting about oh, as a scholar, as a you know, Western scholar, most instructive, very English. So clearly the Lotus Sutra is a, a key bit of vocab to learn here. This early Mahayana text, the 28 chapters, with its high Buddhology, its exalted view of the, the Buddha and, and Bodhisattvas, its, its key theme of attacking the Hinayana, the small vehicle way of Theravada, and their goals of liberation, emancipation, sainthood, arahathood, as inferior expedience, lesser goals, inadequate goals. The Mahayana view that is drawn from this Lotus Sutra is that all beings are invited to become no less than fully enlightened Buddhas, not just a few uh, elite, as it were. Everyone is, through the grace of innumerable Bodhisattvas, or Buddhas to be, innumerable Bodhisattvas, from humble Bodhisattvas who appear on earth to heavenly Bodhisattvas, all are mentioned in, in, the, in seven different um, 
parables, analogies in the book. A total of 28 chapters. It contains lots of charms and mantras. Well, that's a, a departure from Theravada. So that was section 13.